Hello, and welcome to another episode of Balanced Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce you now. Dr. Kevin Stock is a dentist who has been on a lifelong mission to discover how to bring about the highest levels of health and fitness to himself and to his patients. This quest has led him to become an advocate for a meat-based carnivore diet. As a self-experimental researcher, he has been passionate about health and fitness for two decades. He began his professional career as a dental sleep medicine doctor, where he treated obstructive sleep apnea in his private practice. He invented the NED device, an intranasal device designed to treat snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. He also does a pediatric dentistry through Smiles America. He is an active writer, reader, and researcher on topics from health and fitness to science and philosophy. He shares his findings on his blog, Notes to Self, in his newsletter called The Saturday Seven, and on his podcast, Kevin Stock Radio. Through his annual and infamous challenges, he wrote a book called Your Drum, picked up drawing, learned to make music, and learned the art of growing businesses. Dr. Kevin Stock, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Balanced Body Radio. Hey, Casey, thanks for having me. That was a big, long introduction. I appreciate it. And I wanted to let you know, or hope it's okay, I dressed down today because it is a thousand degrees in St. Louis. So <laughs> I'm a little bit casual. <laughs> that is totally fine by us. Um, I did have to say, I put a shirt on for this interview and I figured you're probably going to give me a lecture. Today is not the best day for me. I haven't been to the dentist in like three or four years. Um, I skipped breakfast today and we all know that's like the most important meal of the day. Um, yeah, and, and I've been outside in the sun and I completely forgot to wear sunblock. So I figured this is gonna be like an hour long lecture. Hey, we have a lot in common going on there. I mean, I put this on the shirt on for the interview. I just wanted to, you know, make sure people are comfortable elite enough, but I mean, the air conditioner can't keep up in here, so it's hot. Wow. Uh, yeah. And I also, I mean, I actually went to the dentist recently, but before that it has been a long time. So I don't go with six month recalls like most people. Uh, not, not that there's anything wrong with that, but, and I was also out in the sun walking without a shirt on this afternoon. So, I mean, we both have a, we need a lecture from someone else, I guess. I guess so. That's great. Um, no, it is amazing. I, I post about this all the time. I, I can't stand this idea that the sun is bad for us in any way. When we have evolved with the sun for millions and millions of years, it's absolutely ridiculous that we would take chemicals and apply it to our body as a way to protect ourselves from the sun. It's like, I, again, I just posted about this. Don't, don't burn. Don't get a sunburn. It's not great for you. Find other ways to deal with the sun. But once you do, and once you start to build up that melanin in your skin, you'll never burn. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where it's like everything we've been taught is like wrong and, you know, making the villain out of basically the things that we've evolved with that make us healthy, like the sun, like meat. Uh, so yeah, I make it a point to get out in the sun literally every single day. And I enjoy it like a 20 minute walk in the afternoon around the block. It makes, it's one of the things I've been super consistent with for the last several years that I've added into my routine that has just made a huge difference. I, I look forward to like, I'm gonna, all right, I'm going on my walk, 20 minute walk midday, get the UVB rays, also just clears the head, get the body moving. Cause I'm pretty sedentary besides that, that my workout. So. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that was the biggest gift that we got out of the pandemic is time to go on walks and getting out and watching the sunrise every single morning, being out in the sun. You're right. Clearing your head. I mean, we get maybe 10, 12 miles a day of walking and it's fantastic. Completely transformed our lives. See, that's great. And I agree. That is like one of the big things that came out of my new habits from the pandemic two things one was morning mobility work because i neglected that area for a long time uh, and i was like all right i'm picking that up and then also like the walk so those two additions like they seem small but like have been i've i think made a big difference yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, there's a, such a wide variety of topics that we could cover today. I do want to kind of craft our discussion around a recent Instagram post that you wrote that I thought was fantastic. Um, and we can definitely get into that and that will help us kind of cover everything in an organized way. But before we do that, let's, let's, uh, in, let's introduce you to our listeners and let them hear your story of how you got interested in health and fitness and then how you also got interested in dentistry. Oh, okay. Let's see how I can make that short. Uh, so the short story of it, I was an overweight kid, like probably a lot of overweight kids didn't want to be overweight. And junior high, seventh grade is when I was like, I'm right, starting to be able to take this into my own hands before that, you know, I had no idea, like just as a child, you don't know what to do. So seventh grade, I started taking matters into my own hand, 
made all the wrong kind of decisions, like not eating any food, running miles on end. I did lose the weight, but that was not the direction I wanted. Uh, so subsequently throughout high school, experimenting with diets, getting working out, starting to figure out the right way to do things. Uh, in college, I uh, studied chemistry. I also got a minor in biology. So I was focusing on the sciences. I really just funneled everything through like, how do I use this anatomy course, this biochem, and funnel that through like the burning fat, building muscle. Uh, and so I started figuring things out in college. I decided to go to dental school. Why I decided to go to dental school, that's another story. We could dive into that, but uh, went to dental school, started a blog teaching more, basically writing about the stuff I figured out <laughs> and continue to figure out. Wanted to practice what I preached, started doing physique competitions in dental school. And after dental school, went into dental sleep medicine, started dental sleep medicine practice, treating uh, basically obstructive sleep apnea due to the limitations. So dentists have a special way of treating that with oral devices. We can also go into that. Uh, but there are some limitations with that, which led to this idea for this NED device, which is a nasal EPAP dilator to treat snoring. It treats snoring right now, not yet FDA approved for sleep apnea. But so I started developing that pretty early on, got the patent. It took until 2020, the you know, one good thing that came out of that year, I got the patent for that finally. Um, and then just to kind of wrap this story up, I was focused on, I would say, we talk about health and fitness in one breath usually. And one thing I, I it seems like so obvious now in retrospect, but I was focused on fitness for 15 plus years until I, I realized like, I didn't feel as good as I, I had all kinds of like, weird health things going on mainly i didn't was i didn't have the mental performance capacity to do the work i was wanting to do every day and so i went back and did another ketogenic diet helped a little bit long story short i figured, found my way to just eliminating plant-based foods and i started eating red meat for in any significant quantity for the first time in my life felt amazing went down that rabbit hole and here we are today i think that kind of wrapped up some of the major milestones. <laughs> yeah, that's quite comprehensive. I, I do want to ask you, with dentistry itself, what direction are we going in? What kinds of things are you seeing in clinic? And are we improving our dental health by and large as a society or not? So I practice dentistry in two kind of niche areas. One is pediatrics and one is dental sleep medicine. Dental sleep medicine is the treating of obstructive breathing, basically sleep disorder breathing. Uh, but the pediatrics, I work for this company called Smile America Partners. And basically, it is unique in that what I travel around. So I go around to rural areas in Missouri, where there's basically not a dentist or very underserved, usually Medicaid, low socioeconomic areas. And so I see kids basically throughout Missouri tend to be lower socioeconomic. And uh, yeah, the amount the, the, how do I say this? The oral health is just an absolute disaster. I, I don't know how else to put it besides that. Um, school breakfasts and lunches are, you know, make it so obvious why this is an issue. Uh, but really kids in general, even in higher socioeconomic situations eat terrible diets. So it's pretty much universal. And, you know, decay is normalized, orthodontia is normalized, getting wisdom teeth out is normalized. These are all like not normal things that didn't happen in our, you know, ancestral evolutionary past that are now normalized pathologies. Uh, and the role of nutrition in this is, if not the number one most important thing, which I believe it is, uh, it's up there. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. I remember my dentist would tell me as a kid, like, avoid candy, but it wasn't even like avoid sugar. Like we would still drink Kool-Aid by the gallons and, you know, eat sugary jams and all this stuff. I remember candy is not great. You can have it around Halloween and have like two or three pieces a day, but that was about it. Can you tell us what things in our, you know, normal nutrition, normal diet are, are affecting dental health the most? Yeah. And one thing that it gets left out a lot is not only like, what are we eating that's hurting our teeth? But it's what are we not eating that would provide our teeth with the raw materials, the vitamins and minerals that would fortify our teeth to be able to protect themselves against acidic attacks. So that's one of the big things like nutritional deficiencies, but we don't think about that, uh, where our teeth are not armed, they don't have the immunity that they should to be able to prevent decay. So that's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is we're eating food that is creating this attack on the teeth. So we got, we're getting, we're losing on both fronts. One is we're 
where you have nutrient deficient diets, uh, especially pediatrics, kids, when they need even more nutrition than like an adult, like times of growth, like pregnant women, adolescents, when we're going like through rapid growth, we need even more nutrition. Uh, and kids are absolutely not getting that. And then for, you know, carb based, sugar based diets uh, that are, that precipitate the acid attacks on the teeth, uh, basically the perfect storm. Yeah. Interesting. I, I love how you made those two separate distinctions and, and thinking about that, I think is really important. It's almost like a ketogenic diet is beneficial because you're eliminating the bad stuff and you're getting more of the healthy stuff that works kind of in both ways. For somebody that's not familiar with this concept, can you talk about the airway and why dental health is so important for breathing, especially as we sleep? Yeah. So the airway, I think it's perhaps the most undiagnosed serious mouth condition, definitely in the Western world is sleep disordered breathing. And what it means is basically you go to sleep, we have this airway. So people that are watching the circle with my hands uh, and the muscles relax, the tongue relax, soft palate relaxes and the airway starts to collapse. So it gets smaller, a little bit of shrinking. It's still fine. You can breathe. Uh, you, if you hear snoring, that's a good sign that the airway is obstructed, but there's at least still air moving. Okay. Now, if you have something called apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, and apnea is where the airway totally shuts off. So you're literally suffocating. And there's two kinds of apneas. One's a hypopnea, one's an apnea. We don't, I don't know if we need to get into all the technical details, uh, but basically the airway is shrinking to such a degree where there's no airflow going or the airflow is so minimized that the oxygen in your blood is dropping by 4% or more. Uh, and so this happens, the airway shrinks or closes off. The body doesn't want to die. So it pumps adrenaline, cortisol, these hormones that are basically going to wake you up. And usually it's a subconscious awakening. So it's not like you wake up, oh, I'm awake, but subconsciously awake up so that you get out of that deeper layer of sleep. So the muscles tighten, the airway opens just to let all that relaxation happen again and shuts down again. And then the body forces it open again. And this happens many times an hour, all night long. As you can imagine, you don't get any real deep sleep uh, or REM sleep in this state because uh, the body doesn't want to die. And some of the big factors here, one of the biggest ones is, is overweight. So you, people that are overweight increase like this adiposity gets deposited in the tongue. And so you start getting what I call fatty tongue. We are, we're starting to become familiar with fatty liver, which was not a diagnosis, like up until recent history, really. Right. <laughs> like right. I think it came, became a diagnosis in the seventies, maybe. Uh, I think the next new diagnosis is going to be called fatty tongue. So we have this fat tongue and there, the airway, there's not enough space in the mouth and the airway. So it blocks the airway. Uh, and so what I would do as a dentist is we'd make these devices similar to like, if you were ever taught CPR to lift the jaw, to open up the airway. So the devices hold the mandible in a position that helps basically splint the airway open. Yeah, that's so interesting. We talked to Dr. Hang about face forward kind of, um, um, what, what is it called? Orthopedics? Basically, we're orth orthodontist. So you're trying to bring the jaw further forward also, which is also something that can crowd the mouth. Yeah. So one of the, you know, if you have sleep apnea, in this condition I was just talking about, one of the most successful treatments is maxilla, uh, basically surgery, where they're going to move your maxilla forward and your mandible forward. Basically, they're going to move your face forward. And what that does is that creates the airway, the space in the back of the uh, throat for, you know, the bigger airway. Yeah, that's so interesting. How pervasive are sleep um, issues uh, related to apnea? Is it something that m like a majority of people at this point are experiencing? Not a majority yet, but we're on our way. Uh, it's estimated that up to one in four U.S. adults suffer from some form of from mild to severe obstructive sleep apnea. And then if we throw in snoring in there, which is sometimes class classified, which I think appropriately is upper airway resistance syndrome, which is basically saying that airway is starting to shrink and the body's having to force air to get in. Um, then we're talking about a much higher percentage of the population. And there's some evidence that even if you have upper airway res resistance syndrome, so air is still going in and out, you're still breathing, you're not having these apneas, it still does disturb your sleep. So it impairs your sleeping, which impairs a whole bunch of downstream factors. Uh, so if one of the interesting things when in my practice, I would see patients and, you know, we would go through their medical history and they're all on antidepressants. Uh, they're all on all these medications. And it makes sense if you think of it from the point of view, like it takes on average five to 10 years for someone to get diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea. That means for five to 10 years, almost a decade, they've not had a good night's sleep. And so like, 
how could you not be depressed and tired and overweight, like in that situation? Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely awful. And speaking of pervasiveness in, in our community, um, let's get into that post that you wrote, which refers to a study which came out, I believe it came out recently, but was the date uh, 2018 that it was, um, that the numbers were taken from? What study are you referring to? So this is the 93% of Americans oh, now. Oh, yes. And the 7% oh, of Americans that are that are healthy. Yes, that was recent. Uh, yeah, done out of Tufts. So yeah, the recent paper out of Tufts. They looked at, I believe it was five markers to assess uh, cardiometabolic health and U.S. adults, 93% of us, it was over 93% uh, are not cardiometabolically healthy. And the most significant increase in that number was due to obesity and diabetes. Wow. Wow. Okay. So was that, were those numbers taken pre-pandemic or was this now post-pandemic? So the numbers were taken through, I'd have to double check. I think, I think it's, I, I believe it's pre pandemic. So it's probably worse now. Uh, probably worse now. Yeah. And that's what we were saying about the, what was it? The 12% study that came out in 2016. Like, Oh, I'm sure this is a lot worse now. <laughs> and this was only like two years later and it's already like half. That's funny. Cause I talked about that when that came out a bunch about, it was basically 12% of people being metabolically healthy. And then this one comes out and says, no, no, it's less than 7%. And I remember looking at the 12% one and I was like, their criteria for metabolically health isn't even that strict. And wow. like, if I was going to have criteria, it would have been a little bit stricter to classify metabolically healthy. So yeah, we're talking about like that, you know, five out of a hundred, you know, a handful of people out of a hundred that are actually metabolically healthy. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Basically, everyone is not. <laughs> that's that's right. And if you go anywhere, walk around anywhere and just look around, you can count on one hand, generally speaking, in a crowd of people, people that you can pick out and say, yeah, he probably works out. He looks generally fit. It's a vast minority for sure. Just if you're out looking around and that doesn't include all the people that are staying home and getting Uber Eats delivered all the time. It's really terrible. Um, a horrible situation that we're in. You wrote a fantastic post, seven steps to join the 7%. And the number one thing that you said, I want to make sure I get this right, is remove sugar and seeds. And, and you added seed derived foods. Can you explain a little bit about what you meant by that? Yeah, I like to keep things simple. Uh, because when I when, when someone hears like a rule of thumb, like if I say, look, just don't eat seeds or sugar, like that's something easy to remember. Uh, but the problem with that is people don't really know what seeds are. I think when people hear seeds, they think of like sunflower seeds, but really, so I add in seed derived products because if you go through, go to the grocery store and try and find the products that don't have uh, either sugar or something that is derived from a seed, you almost cannot do it unless you are in the meat section or fresh produce. Uh, like that's the, basically the only thing that is, doesn't have these two things. So I, having that simple rule of thumb, it forces someone into eating like real foods is what I would call them. Uh, but seed derived products are, well, commonly, so seeds, we're talking about grains. So people that aren't familiar with grains, you got wheat, you have rice, you have corn, you have uh, oats. So th th these are grains, which are the seeds of grasses, but those aren't the only seeds. So we got seeds of trees, like nuts. We have seeds, legumes. Those are the beans, like soybeans. So when someone really gets familiar to be like, okay, what are seeds? And an easy way to, to kind of think about why seeds are bad is like plants want to survive, right? And the critical part of their survival is their offspring. So they protect these offspring. And so when you're eating their seeds, they're trying to poison you so that you don't eat their seeds. Easy way to think about it. Overly simplified, but it's an easy way to think about why you don't want to eat seeds. Uh, and then we know grains are seeds. We know beans are seeds. And so let's avoid these things. But then we have to also think like those are kind of the I'll call them the quote unquote pure seeds, but then we refine these into flowers and we industrially process them into seed oils. And these are, those are the things that are just pervasive in all our junk food. If you look up junk food, it'll say, what is it? Well, it's basically, junk food is basically seed oils and sugar. Like that is what junk food is. <laughs> That's heart healthy breakfast cereal, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same thing. That's crazy. Have you seen the video uh, they made? It's the, the How Was It Made series, which is actually like super entertaining, but they show how canola oil is made. Yes, I have. And, and it's when people watch that, they're like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm eating industrial machine lubricant. Horrible. 
It's horrible. Yeah. It's so scary. We'll link that in the show notes. We've talked about that probably 17 times on this show. And it, I, I get so grossed out every time that I see that. Now, the issue becomes we have to eat something, right? And so if I just eliminated pretty much everything in the middle of the grocery <laughs> store, now yeah. you're right. I've got produce and I've got meat. This is how you kind of got into the carnivore diet. Do you think that most people should be animal-based or moving towards a carnivore-style diet? I think I kind of have two rules of thumb. One is we humans, homo sapiens, as much as we hate to admit it, we are far more similar than we are different. And like a species, we should be eating a similar diet. There's not some homo sapiens that are meant to be vegan and some homo sapiens that are meant to only eat meat. We are far more similar than we are different. We should be eating a similar diet. And I believe the evidence is unquestionably we should be eating a meat-based diet. Uh, now, the second caveat to that is we are a unique species in that we do have differences, slight genetic differences, but significant differences in cultures and lifestyle and goals. And, you know, basically the, these kind of other things that we use food as part of our daily lives. And so I think it's important to account for that. And so when I tell people like, Hey, you should eat mostly meat. I, I say mostly meat, even though maybe they would do best with only meat, uh, because you need to make it work in your life. Uh, because any, the perfect diet that you can't do is not a perfect diet. So that's kind of the important caveat I like to kind of put on the back end. Yeah, that's great. I love that. And I love that you made the point earlier about keeping things really simple. And I found that going strict carnivore did exactly that. It keeps things very simple. When I get questions from my clients to say like, okay, well, you told me about oxalates, but what if I only have one sweet potato a week? It's like, I don't know. What if I have a spinach salad twice a week? It's like, I don't know. There's always a question with these plants. There's always going to be a question and it will go back to the same thing every time. If you eat, you know, mostly beef, if you get it from a good source, you supplement that with maybe some eggs or some other meat sources, you're, you, that, that's the only way I know to answer that we really don't need to worry. Yeah, one of the hardest things in nutrition is this idea of false negatives, meaning we eat something really terrible for us and we don't have an immediate negative response. And I, I think like people with Crohn's disease, for example, I, I like to just like, let's, let's think about the positive of that. They eat something with gluten, the body gives them an immediate response do not eat that. Right. Yep. Whereas a lot of other foods, for example, I, I, I can eat a donut right now and I would probably feel just fine. Doesn't mean that's just fine that I can just go on eating that. It's so like to your, to your point with oxalates, it's, it's a classic, it's a classic problem food because they do bioaccumulate. So let's say you had one potato a day, you feel just fine. But if you aren't clearing those oxalates well, and you're starting to bioaccumulate them, maybe it takes five years before you start having like joint pains. Where does that coming from? Starting to feel like I have fibromyalgia. Uh, and it's really hard to pin the source down, right? Because it, I've been eating these for five years. I felt fine. That can't be the, 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 the culprit, right? So this idea of false negatives in nutrition is really tough. Uh, and like you said, it's hard to know for a lot of these, like what is the, I like to say the dose, the frequency and the duration makes the poison. But <laughs> while that is true, it's hard to know what dose, duration, and frequency is okay of what poison so that you don't get sick. Yeah, that's right. It's so interesting. I'm, I'm curious to know what your experience with this is. This is. We've interviewed Sally Norton twice on our show. Monique Attinger is also the low ox coach on Twitter. She's great. And, and learning more about this, you start learning like, whoa, oxalates as one of these phytochemicals, it, it and there's plenty more, can be really challenging for a lot more people than we probably think. And explaining this to people, it, there's a lot of resistance out there. It's almost like people don't want to hear that some of these superfoods that they have prized in their diet for so long, they, they almost don't want to learn about it. It's weird. Yeah. I, oxalates, I give them a lot of credit on my journey because I actually did a deep dive in oxalates. It was probably 2016, uh, where I was like, okay, I'm going to eliminate oxalates as well as plant lectins. And I was like going to re really reduce phytic acid as well. <laughs> but when I did remove these three, basically plant toxins, it basically removed the entire plant kingdom. Uh, so it. I was basically eating only meat. Uh, and so I'm sorry, I kind of lost uh, the original question, but like that was what kind of led me on that journey originally was these insidious oxalates that I'd studied. And I was like, Hey, I think I should try a diet without these. 
Yeah. So to that point, the question, like, like you were in a place where you were ready to eliminate them. And it seems like when somebody's complaining to me about gut issues or skin issues or joint issues, and I say like, I, it might be your spinach that you're, you know, blending up every single morning. It's there's so much resistance with people. I'm just wondering if that's something you've noticed as well. Oh yeah. The resistance is, I think the conditioning that now that I would think it's fair to say we've all had where healthy grain, healthy carbs are the grains, right? even though they've given you all kinds of gut issues, those are the healthy grains, the healthy fats are the vegetable oils. And this is what I have been brought up believing. And I think about it now, I kind of laugh. But when I was a kid, my mom was a nurse, my my dad had cholesterol concerns, and she was forcing him to eat this fake cheese. And he just hated the fake cheese. And she's like, you gotta have it. It's not bad for your cholesterol. But it's really it's just this super hot trans fat junk cheese that he should not have been eating for heart health. Uh, but that was the conditioning of the time. Like my mom was trying to do the right thing for my dad. And it was like the exact the worst thing you could worst. probably do. Yeah, totally. Wow. We really love um, Dr. Bill Schindler's approach too. I know you probably just spent some time with him at KetoCon uh, as he was there. Reading his book right there behind me. Nice. It's so good. Yeah. It's a great book. Eat like a human. And he just says in the book, like plants should scare the hell out of you. He eats plants, but yeah, he, he respects them. There's ways that we have learned as a species to deal with some of these toxins by fermenting and soaking and all of these, you know, kind of getting to be like esoteric and lost arts of dealing with food that all of our cultures have ingrained in them if we go deep enough. Yeah. So I'm about halfway through the book. So I, I saw him at KetoCon. Uh, yeah. And I got his book and I was like, I, I need nice. to read that on the airplane on the way home. Didn't finish it, but uh, I'm halfway through. And you know, what's really striking me at this point is <laughs> uh, in order to eat plant foods, it is a hell of a lot of work. Now, Bill will tell you it's easy. You know, he's got it down. He's like, if you have all the time in the world, just focus on like preparing food, you can detoxify these plant sources to varying degrees. Right. Holy cow! It's a lot of work. I'm th I'm going through this book. I'm like, in order to eat that piece of food, I got to spend the next three weeks fermenting, soaking, sprouting. And so, to me, it's, it's it's bad to say. Like, if you're like Bill and you can spend time to do that, that's awesome. But I think it's not practical for a lot of people. <laughs> Dude, totally, totally. My wife had this idea to make um, kimchi recently, and you know we fermented foods fine let's make it ourselves rather than buy it from the store and oh my goodness dude I, I stopped at three different stores to get all the ingredients <laughs> everything is like in plastic everywhere you, yeah. you bring it home you cut it all up it took forever I threw away <laughs> the ends of all these vegetables and I was like I can't I used to do this every day for salad like ridiculous <laughs> yeah and I think the the culture in western world at least has changed a lot for example I know my girlfriend she would love to spend more time cooking, but she's a full-time job. She's a kid and she gets home and it's like, it's five 30. The kid needs to eat. You don't have time to cook a big meal. Uh, and it's, I, th I think for a lot of people, even if you're going to include plant-based foods, if you're trying to include the best ones and do it the right way, it's a lot of work. A lot of resource. It's a lot of resources. Yeah. 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 And, and, that's, and you gotta learn how to do it. Like I'm reading this book. I'm like, it's kind of complicated. <laughs> He's, he does a great job kind of simplifying, walking you through the process, but yeah, it, there, there's a lot. Whereas like I pull a steak, I sear, sear, um, I eat like my meal is less than 10 minutes. It's probably five minutes. <laughs> totally. Yeah, totally. I added up recently, like all the things that I eat in a day, it took less than an hour to eat it all. It cost me about $17 to eat it all. It's just going back to that simplicity. It is so simple. If you want to try this type of a diet, which is a really good segue to your number two, which is buy a deep freezer and a side of cow. So tell us um, why you included that in this list of your top seven things to join the 7%. There's a few reasons. One is that there's a lot of reasons. Good. And I try to pack a lot into a nugget of a tweet. So one is, if you go buy a deep freezer and a side of cow, you just bought over 200 pounds of meat. Guess what? You just made an investment that you don't want to waste your money on, right? So you are going to eat all that meat. That's going to, it's a forcing function to make someone start to incorporate more meat into their diet. And you're supposed to eat it in six to 12 months. No problem for me. But for most people, they're like, okay, I got now 250 pounds of meat in the freezer. I got six months to eat it. I need to eat this much to get through my investment. Right. So one of it is part of it is psychological. Uh, part of it is like, we we're talking about, it's amazingly 
convenient to have basically a grocery store at my house, so to speak, where I don't ever have to go anywhere to go get my food. Uh, and so there's that portion of it. Convenience, you save on cost when you're buying in bulk generally. Um, you're supporting local farmers and the environment. And last but not least, and this is an area where I hope there's more research. I know there is more research being done. Um, I want to caveat this saying like most of my benefits have come from eating conventional grocery store beef. Uh, however, when I buy my beef from the local farmers that I buy from here, it is different than grocery store store beef. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because like the grocery store beef, like the cows are basically grown as fast as possible, slaughtered as soon as possible. You know, it's it's a business, right? And so they're optimizing business. Whereas maybe the farmers I'm buying from, they're raising the cattle longer. They're having spending more time on the grass. So they're getting more nutrition because they're spending more time on the grass. Uh, so just as kind of the last thing, I I fundamentally think there's probably slight differences in the nutritional quality from, you know, if you buy a cow from your local farmer who's grass feeding the cow most or the entire life of the cow uh, versus conventional beef. Now, that's not to say if you can't afford grass-fed beef, don't go with conventional beef. Uh, but I do think that's kind of an added benefit. Uh, so there's lots of reasons why I'm like, go buy a deep freeze get a relationship with a local farmer. It's going to force you to eat the meat. You're going to get the best quality. It's convenient. You're going to save money. Like all these things come from that. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I think that's the best thing for the environment as well. I mean, so many people go plant-based and vegan because they love animals. They love the environment. They love the planet. They don't understand how completely destructive your agriculture is, how many animals die in combines, all the land that we destroy. Like, like you are using one life that spent its entire life building up topsoil, sequestering carbon, and making the grasses grow better, like all around, it's better. And, and that gives you food for so long. I think like if someone is concerned about the environment and if they are concerned about animal welfare, the eating a pure beef diet that you bought from a local farmer that does regenerative agriculture is the greatest benefit thing you can do to support both those causes like yep. hands down like you said you're killing like how many cows are someone going to eat a, a year if they're only eating beef maybe two three you know animals whereas you know if you're eating plant-based but you're killing a hell of a lot more than three animals right. uh and these animals are when they're especially you know treated by local farmers that treat the animals right like you said they're regenerating topsoil they are improving uh, the environment, uh, re regenerating soils, sequestering carbon, like you said. So absolutely. Yeah, that's right. And that's to say nothing about the nutritional quality of a cow versus other animals we can have, which is fine, but, but I'm, I'm with you. I do think the foundation of a good properly done carnivore diet should be beef or other ruminant animals. Yeah. I think, I think what part of my pause is like with the mon monogastrics, chicken, pigs, when they are fed poor feed, which they are, they're fed corn and soy uh, the quality of their fat is going to be less ideal, especially for people that need to lose fat. And yeah. so if eating the fat, which we, you know, I think we should be eating the animal fat, then we want to be eating ruminant fats, really the best, uh, yeah. not to say I do eat chicken, I do eat pork, but it's a minority part of my diet. Yeah. That's kind of how I structure mine as well. I love that. Number three, resistance training. Tell us about resistance training. Resistance training is important for so many reasons. I mean, I remember, so my journey was I started resistance training for pure vanity reasons, uh, but it transitioned to like pure mental health reasons. Like, look, I need to work out because I need this to feel good. I need this to give me a break in the day. Like, so that it transitioned to that. Uh, but one of the underlying issues most people have today is uh, hyperinsulin, hyperinsulinemia. Basically, they're pre-diabetic or diabetic. Uh, and one of the best things you can do to cure that, <laughs> I'll use cure, even though most people would not say cure, uh, is resistance training. Uh, and so it's super important uh, for longevity. It's one of the strong, long, one of the best predictors of longevity is like how long you're going to hold your muscle mass, right? How long you're able to continue to move. Uh, it is. So I think I don't talk about it as much as diet because I think people do realize resistance training is important, but there is this, I'll say legacy 
health idea that doing lots of cardio is the way to health. And I'm not against cardio, but I do think people should, if they are more cardio inclined, they should really kind of fo- reshift their focus attention to uh, resistance training, m- building lean body mass uh, to at least complement that. But I think it should be the main part of someone's fitness routine uh, is the resistance training. Yeah, I love that. I, I spent 13 years working on a metabolic heart. And so I got to measure people's metabolisms to see, you know, the resting metabolic rate. And it was always the people that strength trained that had the higher metabolic rates than the people doing cardio. And it was like, you got used to seeing the two parts of the gym, like there's the cardio part and then there's the resistance training part. And it's like, if you're looking at the cardio part, if you're, if you're there long enough, you're just noticing patterns, you'll see people change their size temporarily. Like you'll become a smaller person for a little while. And then I'm not going to see you for probably like four or five months. And then you come back and you might be a bigger, same, same, you know, structured person of the other side is where people change their shape. And it was like permanent. And that was the resistance training side. It's so really funny. I mean, what, what you said is exactly what I see when someone goes to like, look, they say oh, they're overweight. They want to lose weight. What are they going to do? They're going to start eating less. And they're going to start exercising more. This is like, that, that's what people do. But this is the problem that they have. What you just said is when they lose weight, they're losing probably close to proportionally fat and muscle at the same that's time. Right. So their big self just turned into a smaller self uh, with the same or worse percent body fat. What also happened is their me- metabolism went down. And the cardinal mistake I see is this happens. It's unsustainable because they're starving. They're malnourished. They're trying to because the diet part isn't right. They're just eating less. Uh, and so eventually they cave in. Right. But what happens is when they cave in, they don't regain the muscle mass back. No, nope. maybe a little bit. They put all the fat mass back on. So they're in the state where now they are worse than they were before. Their metabolic rate is lower than it was before. Yeah. And so then the next time they diet, they have to do that even more severe. I got to eat even less and you got to do even more cardio. And then they give up and it's like this vicious spiral. Uh, and that is what I tend to see with a lot of people who struggle with weight loss is they they're like the ones that were health conscious and they've tried diet after diet, after diet, diet, after diet. And it's this negative spiral that has actually put them in a worse spot than like a lot of the men that I'll see who are 50 years old, never been on diet in their life. They'll go to the gym a couple of times a week. They tend to lose weight quite a bit easier because they've not done this, this part of the metabolic damage. Totally. Uh, Whereas a lot of women, and not to just overly generalize, but a lot of women who are like, look, I've been trying for years, decades. And this guy lost all that weight on the carnivore diet and I'm struggling. And this is one of the cardinal reasons why. Yeah. It's too bad because all of these people independently on their own think they suck. They think they can't follow the advice good enough you know, us as trainers, we just turn around and blame them for not, you know, doing it good enough when it's not working for everybody. And and if more people knew that that advice didn't work for everybody, hopefully we would see more of a paradigm shift towards that resistance training. And we don't need to go too far in depth with this. I love how you make your resistance training really practical. You know, you lose the gym during the pandemic. And so you find other ways to do your workouts, which is absolutely wonderful. We found the same TRX straps, a few resistance bands, grab a kettlebell. Like, these things don't cost a ton of money. You get so much benefit for it. I do want to ask you about a recent post that you did since we're kind of converging on nutrition and exercise with creatine. Can you tell us a little bit about creatine and whether that's a good thing to supplement? Yeah. So (laughs) my general recommendation to the general population is like, yeah, creatine is a great thing to supplement. Uh, And so creatine, it's one of the most researched nutritional supplements. One of the very few, maybe the only one besides like caffeine that shows consistent improvements in like physical uh, performance as well as mental performance uh, for creatine. Yeah. Uh, Especially with an elder, uh, elder populations. Uh, (laughs) So the body does make like one gram of creatine per day, but that's not enough to saturate muscle stores uh, and what I would call optimal creatine levels. So the only way you're gonna get optimal creatine levels is if you're eating for a woman, one, two pounds of red meat, a man, two to three pounds of red meat, seems like an astronomical amount, right? But if you're eating a carnivore diet, that's basically what you fall into. And I like to say, it's like creatine, like when I read that research, it's almost like it is the perfect proxy measure for how much meat we should be eating. Like, okay, if you want to optimize your creatine stores without supplementation, how much meat do I need to eat? That's probably how much you should be eating. You know, that's a nice good proxy measure. Uh, but most people don't. So I think, do think most people would see benefits if they did supplement. I mean, I, I'm almost always against supplementation, but I, 
I'm tempted to be like, why is that not in your diet? Like, like vegans that need to supplement with B12, they absolutely need to supplement with vitamin B12, but it's like, obviously your diet is wrong, right? (laughs) You're going to die without that supplement. It's, that's not the right diet for optimal health, at least. That one argument alone, if we didn't have a supplement 40 or 50 years ago for this, you couldn't live like that's that one argument alone. And I feel the same way. Brain damage. Yeah. Yeah. I I feel the same way about supplements. If, If you want to take a supplement, I want to know why. I want to know what reason are you going to take this? I don't think it's a great idea to take some stack of all kinds of different stuff. It, it, you don't even know what's in the in the bottle anyway. Why would you take this whole stack of you know multivitamin when you don't you don't know what you actually need or what you don't need? Metabolism is I love studying metabolism. It is endlessly complex. And so it's that's a frustrating thing, but also I I kind of enjoy it. Well, I'll I will never get to the bottom of the rabbit hole. But and I say that because we have this naive idea that, look, I'm going to take whatever supplement and that's because I'm low on it, that whatever you're taking is interacting with who knows how many chemical reactions that right. happen in your body. And so we try and manage this. So I, I, I pick on vitamin D because I know a lot of people take vitamin D and, and it's, it's perhaps the right decision for some people. Uh, but I know like if you're taking vitamin D, well, you also need to be taking vitamin K too, but all these fat soluble vitamins work synergistically. So is it going to like, do you need to take E and A as well? Like, and so the, it just gets so, so complex where we try and outsmart our body but through supplementation. And like, maybe one day we'll get there where we can outsmart it. Like we're smart enough. We know exactly how to do it all, but we are not there. Um, and so I almost think for a lot of times, I actually saw an, a very fascinating case study video just this past week, uh, it was about supplements. I need to share, I'll share it in the newsletter. Uh, Please. But, but they're taking all, these, he's taking all these supplements and he's just uh, then a mess. He's in the, he's having all kinds of problems in the ER, but they, it's a, it's a good example of trying to micromanage the body with supplements. And then he's just, he's in a toxic storm of a mess. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, wow. That's crazy. I think if we would have bioengineered everything, Impossible Burgers would have been the absolute best way that we could do that and hit all those boxes that we need. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned vitamin D, great segue. Number four, walk in the sun. And I, I th- those are two things. I want to talk about both walking and being in the sun. We've already talked a little bit about it. Why did you include that as number four? I, and like kind of like what I was saying with like buy a deep freeze and a cow because it has multiple benefits. Just that as side benefits. It's not just one thing like walk in the sun to me is not just about getting vitamin D. That's definitely a part of it. Half of it is mental health. And I talked about working out for mental health. I can't tell you like walking for 20 minutes outside where you're like, okay, no more. I I don't have my phone. There's no email. There's no one talking to me. I just go and I just walk. And then the brain just starts over the last two years. I've had all my ideas. Basically all the ideas I've had has been in that 20 minute block where it's like, oh, I, okay, I'm free to think or just like enjoy the environment. Uh, so that's at least half the importance to me. The other half is like, I want to get sun. I know that's important. The other part is I'm sitting in this chair and I know this the body's not designed to sit in this chair for 12, 15 hours a day. So I want to mitigate the damage I know I'm doing, getting up, getting blood flow, moving the lymph around. I think that's very beneficial. Uh, and there was more reasons to this. <laughs> oh, and like I was saying, vitamin D is not alone. Nitric oxide, endorphins, like the sun has all these benefits that most of us need more of. Like a lot of longevity research shows, like people closer to the equator live longer. Could be a lot of co-founders there, but I think getting some sun is a, a huge part in that. And something about like dog walker people that have dogs live longer than those that don't i'm like well it's probably because they got to walk their dogs they got to go out they got to get the sun like a lot of things that we're talking about right here uh i don't walk to do cardio to me i don't consider that cardio it's like so it's just to me it's yes it is cardio but i'm not like strenuous about it (laughs) uh i don't consider car i'm not doing it for fat loss or trying to maintain body composition and i say that here just so people don't confuse that to be like i'm gonna go on my 10 15 minute walk and i'm gonna lose fat if that happens, great, but I, I, I wouldn't count on that result. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm really glad you pointed that out. And it is such a blessing to be able to walk around the neighborhood and get to know, you know, the ducks by the lake and the different trails and all these things. There's so much to really get out and appreciate. And and 
the sunshine. Like if you have been inside for a long time, if you've been under fluorescent lights, like be smart about your sun exposure. Don't go out in midsummer, midday sun. Start early. Start in January and February. You can get a nice base color even before you know vitamin D is quote unquote like available from the sun. You can still start to build up some of that melanin. Just start early. Be smart about it. When it gets too much for you, use shade. Try not to get burned, like we said earlier. But it's so important. And and I think all of us have learned with the pandemic. One of the biggest things that kept coming up is vitamin D levels. People that got whacked by COVID had really poor vitamin D levels. And it's so pervasive with, with everybody in our society. Yeah, what you said, I think is super important, especially regarding melanomas. I was reading recent research on around this, and it ties in with older research, where the problem is we're indoors 24 seven. And then we go on that weekend vacation to Florida and just get roasted. That right. is problematic. And the recent paper I was reading, uh, the melanoma spots were most commonly on places that are not routinely re- uh, that get sunlight. So it, it, That's right. it kind of parrots what I was just saying, where it's like, oh, you haven't taken your shirt off in the sun in 11 months. And then you did. And, oh, I got melanomas there. You know, so you know, like you said, it's super important not to get burnt. And like if someone's asked me, like, would you choose sunscreen over a sunburn? I'm like, look, don't choose a sunburn. Okay. Like that's stupid. I don't, I'm not a sunscreen advocate, but don't go get roasted for no reason. Okay. Like, like you said, I do what you said. Like I start as early as possible. Winters can be brutal in St. Louis, but I still, am always trying to get as much sun as possible during the winter fall and ramp up through the spring and the summer. And now, you know, I can be outside it's a hundred, it's over hundred degrees. It's blazing hot. The sun is high noon. I could be out there cutting the grass for an hour and a half. And like, I, there's no, no burn, no, no yep. nothing. Yep. Totally. I haven't burned in here. Same thing. And I've been ginger. Like I would always burn. So yeah. So, so important. I think, I think we probably understand maybe like half a percent of, of the, what we're actually getting from the sun. It's gotta be way more than just the, the vitamin D that most people talk about. You mentioned several other benefits there. Um, and if that is a good time and place to practice number five, which is breathe through your nose. Why is it so important to practice nasal breathing? Yes. So nasal breathing is, well, it's vitally important. People don't realize it. And for various reasons, one is like, we talked a little bit about the sleep. If you're breathing through your mouth, seems perhaps ironic, your airway is going to be narrower, more prone to collapse. And like we talked about, this is so prevalent. It's getting more prevalent. Uh, but breathing through your nose, we talked about nitrous oxide as well, Mix, mixes the air with nitrous oxide helps with uh, vasodilation. So likely to help prevent cardiovascular events, uh, filters the air, humidifies it, increases oxygen absorption in the lungs into the blood. So breathing through your nose is super important. And to me, super important in preventing sleep issues, because like I was saying, breathing through the mouth, one is, like I said, it's decreasing oxygenation, it's increasing likelihood of collapse, but then it's also disrupting microbiome, oral microbiome, which is important. It's drying out the mouth. It's that's going to definitely increase your chances of oral decay and just poor oral health in general. So as, as like a dentist, you want to keep this shut, uh, especially when you're sleeping. And when I see a kid sitting at rest, like mouth open, breathing through their mouth, to me, it's like a classic sign that of a few things, but inadequate maxillary bone and mandibular bone, basically craniofacial bone development, where the nasal passages are not developed enough. And so they breathe through the mouth because it's easier and there's, there's constrictions in the nasal passages. So to me, it actually signals like early childhood malnutrition. And I, I, I always, the thought that goes through my head frequently is like, if we reclassified mouth breathing, for example, as malnutrition, or we classified what I think is great, like crooked teeth as malnutrition, parents would be like, oh my goodness, my kid has got crooked teeth. They're malnourished. And a lot of this happened, like the damage was done. So now we're trying to put the fires out, but people would start taking childhood nutrition a lot more seriously. If we didn't normalize teeth crowding and it was like, Hey, this is a result of malnutrition. Like your cranial facial bones didn't grow enough to fit all the teeth in them. That's why they're crowding. Uh, Yeah. I think that would like change the paradigm around oral health and nutrition quite a bit, especially in early childhood, when I think it's the most important. 
That's such a good point. It's funny in Brazil, in Portuguese, uh, if you call somebody a boca aberta, which is an open mouth, you're basically calling them an idiot. So it's almost like built into the culture where like you, you can insult somebody by, by telling them they're, they're, they have their mouth open. And it is a, a direct analogy because they tend, people that have developmental like Down syndrome tend to have poor craniofacial development. And so because of that, they they can't like their nose is so obstructed they have to breathe through their mouth uh so sad. and so that's that's kind of probably where that parallel yeah. comes from yeah it's so sad uh, you, you've been talking about sleep number six is prioritize sleep what things should people be thinking about on how to prioritize sleep yeah i think in the sub comments of that of that tweet i was like if you focus on one through five six takes care of itself so if you do like the other side the sleep's going to happen on its own. Uh, and that might be a far, a little bit of a stretch because there are some things that we're doing outside of that, that can damage our sleep. There's a few like big things that move the needle. One is like habituation for people that like tend to go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, they tend to have better sleep. Um, and we've all heard like, if you want to limit the blue light exposure, dark, cool room. I agree with all this. <laughs> it does help. Uh, and, and yeah, so I, I mean, some of the things that everyone's heard a million times, those are good things. Uh, but perhaps the most important thing for good sleep is all the other things we just talked about nutrition, okay. exercise, you got out in the sun helps set circadian rhythms and the circadian rhythm is reinforced with, uh, you know, uh, it's called uh, sleep hygiene. So you're going to bed at the same time, waking up at a similar time. It's yeah. helpful. You get sun in the eyes. Like you open, you don't just <laughs> bury yourself in a closet. Oh, the sun's rising. You see that like that helps set circadian rhythm. So, uh, yeah, sleep is a deep topic, but I think, you know, if we want to hit the big strokes, we did. <laughs> yeah, totally. And we talked to Amber O'Hearn recently about this. She's got some latest research on low carbohydrate diets and sleep and how it builds up that sleep pressure. And I believe sun exposure is a great way to do that as well. Like it's hard for me to stay up much past the time the sun goes down anyway. Like I'm, I'm tired, I'm ready for bed at that point. And it's, it's so much easier to wake up refreshed and feeling better for the next day. The very, oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I'm glad Amber's talking about that. I've seen a talk that she's done. She's great. Um, because a lot of people that switch to a carnivore ketogenic diet, sleep can be impaired early on uh, because the body does see it as like a stress response. I've been eating 60%, 70% of my food is carbohydrates for the last 30 years. And now there's zero. The body will see that as a stress. It can impair sleep for a little bit before adaptation. So I am glad that Amber's out there. Who's, I think I consider her a, a, an authority in the space to help people through, through these sleep issues. Cause it's important. Yeah, authority is such a good word to use when describing Amber. She's such a badass and so, yeah, so smart. <laughs> Number seven, the last one that you included, socialize with other seven percenters. I have the honor of doing that right now, which is great. You <laughs> had uh, the privilege to go down to Austin to go to KetoCon. What does it mean to be able to share these things with others who have similar beliefs and belief systems? So this kind of goes into a little bit of what we were talking about earlier, where you know, I, you know, I talked about a commitment device. You go buy a cow and it kind of commits you to eating all that meat, right? So it's gonna force you to make the right decision. You make a hard decision once and it forces you to make the right decision again, again, and again, again. I love things like that. Uh, but having a social circle is like one, having one of those things all the time. And so I think of it as our environment shapes our behavior more than any of us probably would care to admit. And if we are around in our daily life, but, around people that don't share the same health and fitness kind of priority. That's a constant tug of going back to their, their normal, our old normal that we're trying to escape. And I feel like the way the people that really escape that is they find another community that is going to have at least an equal pull, if not a stronger pull to reinforce like, Hey, this is normal to eat this way. It's familiar to be healthy and fit. Like, and even more powerful is when you have peers that expect that out of you, because we tend to rise to the expectation of those around us. And so if you have five close friends that expect you to like be in the gym and to eat healthy, if you don't, you're kind of like letting down your peer group. It's hard. Right. And so forming as the best you can associating with these quote unquote seven percenters is a way to kind of solidify yourself into the seven percent. And if you do nothing else, like if they skipped steps one through six here and just went to, Hey, this group of five people or seven percenters, they're going to let me in. You can do nothing else. And they will, you will get results because you will be pulled into their belief systems. You will see how they do things. You'll start eating like them doing the things that they do. And like, it's probably, if you had the easiest way to success, that's the way to do it. 
but finding that community and then joining it is is the is the tough part, right? <laughs> and getting rid of the current community. Uh, wow. But it is, I think, one of the most impo- most powerful ways to cement change. Like we white knuckle our way to create change, and willpower works to a degree, but yeah. <laughs> it tends to be like I only have so much willpower, right? Until That's it's right. gone. And so this is a way to get rid of the will willpower and keep results. I love that. That's such a great point. And thinking about the normal person who is in this world seeing the average that 93% have the dad bods, they get sick, they have autoimmune issues, their the blood pressure, the medications. It's like you you lose you lose a sense of what is normal for the sense of what is average. And to be around other healthy people, you're like, wow, no, I can, I can live until 80 and 90 and be healthy and thrive and continue doing my life passion. It's, it's totally different to be around those people. And you can really get a lot of energy and inspiration that way. So yeah. I love that point. I think that's fantastic. I do want to ask you about your challenges that you do every single year for you. Why is it important to have uh, what is called like a beginner's mind? Why is it so important to do something that you're, uh, you know, not not great at i'm not going to say your first uh drawing was all that great sorry uh <laughs> mine would be much better but why is it so important to pick up something that you might not know a lot about or be very good at well i enjoy challenging myself and improving and i it's like kind of this i just enjoy it for quite frankly and like for the drawing i'd like I always like wanted to wish I could learn how to draw and people always assumed like either like a natural artist or you're not. And I didn't believe that. I was like, let's just challenge this belief and do a drawing challenge. And so, I mean, that's where it comes from. I'll tell you what I get a lot of value out of it now is, you know, I obviously talk and work with a lot of people around health and fitness and I am not out of touch with what it feels like to be a beginner and to struggle and to like not know what to do but I've been doing this health and fitness thing for over 20 years. So to me, it's very second nature. Like my diet is second nature workout. Like if someone asks me like how I work out, I'm like, Oh, it's a lot of it's just intuitive. That doesn't help anyone to tell them that my, I work out intuitively or I eat intuitively uh, because people that are beginners, they don't have this unconscious, it's, it's unconscious competence. You know, if there's this four stages of competence uh, and ideally that's where people get, like you could become unconsciously competent. That's when there's no more willpower. It's like, this is, it's a part of your identity. It's natural. It just happens. Uh, but by doing these challenges, I am consciously incompetent. Like I know how bad I am. And in some senses I was unconsciously incompetent. I didn't even know how bad I was. I was worse than I thought I was. Uh, and so I do like continuing to like push myself in different areas. I think it's a decent, I, I do these things because I want to do them, but also, you know, if it's helpful for other people on their journey, whether it's improving in health and fitness or other areas, whereas like the drawing, I, I actually is one of my favorite challenges because it's just like, just start making small current steps, right? A lot of times we're trying to change everything all in one day. And that's like, it's, it's overload and people, you need just like, I can't do all that much. So my drawing challenge was like, look, I'm going to practice drawing for at least five minutes a day. Okay. Like anyone, everyone's got five minutes a day, right? You could set the alarm five minutes earlier. There was no excuse to not be able to do that. And so that was the challenge. Just like, that's it five minutes a day. And now if I want to go, I I like to say there's a floor, but not a ceiling. So some days I'd be like, Hey, I'm really in the mood. I'm going to do 30 minutes today or something like that. Uh, but so I start really small and I let it naturally grow on itself. And you know, my drawings got better and better throughout the year. And here I am four years later. When was that? 2019 or 2020? 2019. Yeah. So I've, I've been over four years. That's my last drawing right there. So uh, good. <laughs> so, so it's good. like, not only did, did I improve, which, you know, which is nice. <laughs> to, you see, so you see improvements as you go. That's helpful for motivation. Uh, but then I, I've been able to stick with it. And like, I'm not making money selling these artworks or anything like that. It's I'm, believe me, I have a very full busy schedule. Uh, <laughs> But to me, it highlights like you can do take small steps. And if you continue to make those small steps, they can add up to make big differences. Even if you are busy, even if it's not priority number one, you can get results in other areas of your life that you'd like to improve. So that's kind of at the core ethos of the challenges. Wow. 
No, I absolutely love that. I think that's such a great way to approach life and keeping that idea in mind that it doesn't have to be much, but just start really small and, and let it go over time. And you just see so many compounding results. You did mention you being busy. I know you're very, very busy. You put out tons of content. Um, I told you off the air that um, your beginner guide that you put out several years ago is probably one of the most shared documents that I share around for people that want to try the carnivore diet. I think it was very, very well done. I love your book, Your Drum. I thought that was fantastic to listen to. And I'm so glad you were the one to read it. Can you tell us a little bit about some of your more recent content and then the Meat Health Academy? Yeah, so Meat Health Academy was a program I created where it, it stemmed out of the essence that we talked about earlier. Like we're far more similar than we are different, and but we also are different. And when someone says, ah, just, you know, eat meat, drink water, it's beautifully simplistic. I love it for that reason. But it brings about an infinite number of questions. Like some of them are just concerns. Like what about vitamin C and what about fiber? What about X, Y, Z? Is this, you know, there's, there's a, a billion questions. Right. And so I combined basically my goal was I've been doing this for, like I said, over two decades. So I want to convent, condense 20 years into two days. <laughs> that was my goal. So it's like 15 hours of like trainings, everything from like how to get started, how, where to go from there. If you want to eat meat only, if you don't want to eat meat only, how do you go about determining like what plant foods to eat, how much? Uh, and so it goes through all that in detail where someone will be like, look, I know how to do this. They have the confidence to know like, this is the way to go. And then the second, like, so that's kind of like the first half of the program. The second half of the program is why. And to me, like it's, you don't need to know why to do something, but when someone understands kind of like the background behind, like, why do we want to avoid certain plants? When they understand the why, they're like, you know what, that makes a lot of sense and it, it'll help stick. it will make it stick a little bit better. Like, so that's Meat Health Academy. And the other thing you mentioned was we, we recently rolled out a new kind of coaching program and it's called GPS 360 Coaching at Meat Health. And it, the whole in point, I, would, I shouldn't say the whole point, but one of the biggest points is like point number seven, how do you associate with seven percenters? And the whole idea of our coaching is we do very small, mostly small team coaching. So there's a coach, meat health coach certified. I work with all the coaches. They have a small team and this team is, they have biweekly coaching sessions and they're also, you know, they're tracking stuff with their coaches, but it's all that where they're associating with people where it becomes normal, fun, enjoyable to create the health change. And what we were talking about off the air, coaching is like maybe 20% what to do. It's 80% how do you do it to get it to stick, right? I can give anyone be like, and I have a great example of this with one of my friends when we were in dental school, she wanted to get in shape. I made the meal plan, the workout plan. I was like, this, like, to me at that point, it was not like, is this going to work? Like it was basically a science math equation. Like, look, this is going to work. Just do this. And she didn't do it. Like, there was no results. Month later after looking, I'm like, man, what did I mess up the program? The reason is like, she didn't do the program, right? And so it's not so much like what to do, half the time. I mean, sometimes it is, there's so much misinformation these days where like, okay, once you get the right information, that's not always enough. You need that next leg to be like, okay, how do we do this? How do we make it stick? And that's what, that's what we really kind of focus on in the coaching program is this community aspect, making it fun, of course, getting direct personal help from coaches, having a team that holds you accountable. Yeah. And we also have fun where, you know, we are going to, we have monthly challenges. We have trivia we have cooking classes we got all this other like kind of stuff to keep it like fun so small in that community that also branches into the bigger overall community but that's that's the meat health coaching that we're that we've been rolling out this year i love that man that is fantastic um where can we send people where can people go so they can find out about your programs all of your offerings which are many where would you like people to go to find you and connect with you and your work I think for people that are most interested in just like the, the meat health, <laughs> like the, the, the site meat.health is the site that, you know, that we run where you can find the 30 day guide to getting started on carnivore diet. Uh, you, anyone can download that just totally free. Uh, also there's other free guides like the health dangers of plant-based diet, uh, which I think a lot of people find valuable because they're like that, that goes into some of the reasons like why did Kevin start not eating plants? Uh, <laughs> and so I, I dive into the research into that a bit. Uh, all that's at meat.health. Some of my other personal stuff, like the challenges, the Saturday seven newsletter, uh, that's at kevinstock.io. So, and I'm on like all the social 
normal places. But those are the two main websites. And if anything, I would say the Saturday Sevens is usually the best of my stuff. So and good. so for people that don't like set, uh, social media, and I'm one of those people who's like, hey, if I find someone I like and they just could give me it once a week, like do yeah. your best stuff once a week. I don't, so I don't have to follow you on YouTube and all these other things. So that's what I try and do with the Saturday Seven, just to put the best stuff in there and yeah, it's awesome. I subscribe to very few newsletters um, and I subscribe to yours and I absolutely love it. I have for years. Dr. Kevin Stock, thank you so very much for everything that you do. Thank you so much for learning all of this stuff and providing these resources for people so that, that people can really change and understand how to do this in a really comprehensive way uh, with their health, fitness and everything we talked about. So thank you again so very much for being so generous with your time today and, and coming on our show. We really appreciate you. Hey, thanks for having me. It was a great talk and you're a great host. So I enjoyed it. Well, thank you. You're an awesome guest. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.